Um, yeah, so uh, we'll, we'll kind of give you a bit the in, intro there, but um, yeah, so I, I go off of the book alongside JR Stormont, who's a uh, ex-co-founder of Cloudability. I've known uh, JR for uh, probably about as much years as I've worked at Atlassian, sort of seven, eight years. Um, and um, sort of been on a journey together about sort of cloud financial management and, and sort of defining this space of, of cloud FinOps. Uh, two years ago, we, we started a foundation with a, about 30 um, practitioners in this field that was been sort of working at large um, companies that are saving quite a lot of money or being very, you know, astute in, in managing lots of, uh, you know, in the billions of dollars of cloud spend. and. And so we pulled these people together to sort of build a foundation. And, and uh, last year we merged that under the Linux Foundation as, a, as a, one of their programs. Um, and then, yeah, I've been at Atlassian as a principal engineer for about eight years now um, and started um, as a sysadmin, moved into uh, what, they, what we call a cloud center of excellence. And then just in the last 12 months of formulating a dedicated FinOps team within Atlassian. And so I've taken the intro to FinOps deck that we, or the foundation has created, and then I totally chopped it to pieces and created a content that's a little bit more targeted towards DevOps. Um, and so hopefully this goes really well. Um, you can tell me at the end, but definitely formulate questions along the way because it's really embarrassing when you ask questions at the end and no one has anything to say. Um, so think about them along the way, definitely. I want to sort of cover, I guess, why we need FinOps, uh, what it is just generally, what it does for DevOps in this space, um, how it fits inside your org and, and how to get involved, um, especially as a, as a DevOps person as well. Um, if you think about the cloud itself and sort of the journey into cloud, some of this is sort of relevant to the sort of scale this gets at, um, sort of pre-2000s, um, pretty much everything was data center centric, um, capex um, weighted spend with a fixed cost, right? Um, early 2000s, we would have sort of the born in the web companies starting. Uh, you got the web, you know, so the Amazons, the Googles, and I guess in, into the 2000s, you got the Facebooks, et cetera. And sort of around 2006 onwards, we start to see the introduction of things like Agile, DevOps, um, and the cloud, the public cloud is, itself with Amazon Web Services starting to kick off. Um, and around two years ago, we, we saw a Gartner report saying that the cloud has sort of hit a tipping point. Um, and at the time, I think they, they pulled up 360 billion. I think the, the number now is, is revised up closer to half a trillion, uh, half, uh, half a trillion dollars worth of cloud spend in, within another couple of years. And so there's significant cloud um, spend happening across the, the world here. Um, but be really important to point out that as, as we move into cloud, the, the spend model goes from that CapEx heavy um, into OpEx and, and the, the costs go from fixed costs, um, and, and I'll cover this in a moment, into this variable cost model. I think if you stand back from FinOps from afar, you might sort of be you know, forgiven for mistaking the, uh, the FinOps as maybe an enemy to DevOps, just because um, a couple of the sort of story points, I think without any context or the depths of understanding would seem like we're maybe saying that DevOps is a problem. Um, and, I, and I'll point out these and then hopefully get to the end of the deck so that you feel like we're actually friend towards DevOps here. Um, two, two big reasons I think this is, um, you know, could be perceived this way is if we look at the recent um, state of FinOps survey, uh, the top pain point that our practitioners highlight um, as, you know, the, the pains they have of implementing FinOps is the number one uh, item was getting engineers to take action. And I think this is maybe just slightly bad wording for what the actual problem is. And I'll, I'll cover at the end of the deck, I promise to come back to this slide and, and cover this topic. Um, but the other one is this slide that we show, which is that DevOps plus cloud um, has broken the traditional procurement model. And so um, I think, unfortunately, the, the, the big thing here is, is people see the DevOps and cloud breaking something and, and takes that away as saying that, you know, we're saying that DevOps and cloud's a problem. But actually what we're saying is that, that the traditional procurement is a problem um, and we need to, to work on that. Um, and so to sort of build that story out. Uh, if you sort of rewind, and this is a sort of story I see a lot of um, a lot of companies have, and it's definitely the company experience that I've had in companies. 
um, you know, we start sort of back in the day, we have these ops teams um, who, I guess they dream about servers, right? They, they love hugging them, they rack and stack them, they, they baby them in the data center. But the way that they get servers is they go to a, a procurement team or accounts team internally, and they'll build these sort of three to five year plans of, of buying equipment and they'll you know, model up how much it costs to buy them, but all the company benefits you're going to get from, from this equipment. Um, and if you craft that, that document well enough, um, you might be lucky enough to get procurement to give you access to the money. Um, and it's at that point that you get these servers and you get to have the fun with those. Um, after that point, you can sort of forget about this procurement team for a few years, right? And there's very little communication after that sort of um, process of pop buying equipment. Um, and then procurement are pretty happy because they really understood the, the purchase they made and they understand the depreciation cycle for that equipment on, onwards. And so we would look at it, the engineers are really requesting money here and finance is sort of the gatekeeper, right? They're, they're approving that. Um, the spend becomes very predictable and static. They have this up, large upfront spend and then over a period of time, they can depreciate it out and they know really what's going to happen in, in as far as company costs go IT-wise month to month. Um, the process of actually going through that procurement cycle of building the plan, getting the equipment and getting some software that, that you know, your customers are benefiting on is a very long cycle. Um, and if you get the equipment incorrect, you know, oversize it, undersize it, or just buy the completely not really fit for purpose equipment on, you know, the, what things look like in a year from now, it's a pretty high cost of failure to the business. I went and um, read the state of DevOps report um, from last year, and I wanted to sort of find some, some key points that uh, align with the way we think in FinOps. One of the things I, I picked out was this, um, this reliance on, or the, the sort of highlighting the fact that, that DevOps's maturity is pointing towards self-service and, and high DevOps evolution, strongly aligned with self-service. Um, and then there's this whole section of the, the document that talks about this sort of um, transitioning from the product model to the platform model. Um, but still, once again, it highlights that self-service is a key element of this, this model within DevOps. And what we see is that that plays out like this. We, we move from that centralized ops team to a more DevOps model, uh, distributing out um, the you build it, you run it models across the businesses. Um, and so you're starting to get more teams within the company needing access to server equipment. And of course, at the same time, we introduce the cloud. And with the cloud, we do things like infrastructure as code, automation, um, scaling with you know, um, you know, last load balances, et cetera. And so things are starting to uh, become less predictable when it comes to these costs. But more importantly, these teams aren't going to like uh, the, the scripts and elastic load balancing, et cetera, is not going to wait around on the speed cycle of a procurement team. And so what ends up sort of happening is, is all of this gets access to the money and procurement's kind of stepped out of the cycle. Um, in the beginning, it's usually pretty fine because the cloud spend is quite low, right? And, and so procurement's pretty happy for this, um, you know, this sort of free credit card access um, that teams end up with. Um, and, you know, at, the other thing that finance is quite often when they look at coming from that traditional cycles is they're happy just to sort of get the bill and then review how things went. And, and so that I, you know, I hear teams where they're like monthly cycles of, of reconciling bills or even worse quarterly cycles where they kind of go back and, and have a look at how they went. Um, and we just know that the cloud can, you know, costs in the cloud can spiral out of control over the weekend. And so what ends up happening so, you know, the bill sort of, it goes from something that's little and procurement doesn't care about, but quickly becomes some, something they do. And so in this model, you've sort of moved to the world where engineers are now spending money with their code. Um, finances lost that visibility. They no longer have that, that chance to, to gate access to spending money. Um, and they don't have any sort of business plan that sort of outlines what the equipment's used for anymore. It's, it's this stuff's happening um, without them sort of being in the process. Um, the spend becomes very dynamic and less predictable. Like, you know, if I asked you what you're going to spend on between 9.30 and 10.30 next, uh, you know, Tuesday, you would be guessing at how much your actual cloud bill for that hour would be. And, and this gets, you know, worse when you start to forecast out for, you know, for a whole quarter or, you know, a whole year. 
um, the the reality is of cloud is that it, it's less predictable um, versus having that fairly standard sort of depreciation cycle of equipment that you bought up front. Um, but what we do get is we get a lot more agile experimentation and a um, lower cost of failure, right? We can we can turn on a GraphDB for a few hours and see if it's actually useful for us um, and turn it off. And that, you know, really low cost in being able to do that. Um, but um, now that we don't have those, so the upfront planning with finance, there's just almost zero communication now happening between engineers and finance. And so sort of, if you look at the realities of what the cloud brings, we have the decentralized buying silos around the business. So these service teams or DevOps teams are now able to sort of spend money at will. The costs are only going to get become more and more material. Remember I said at the beginning that, um, you know, Gartner's forecasting half a trillion dollars in cloud spend across, across the world. Um, and, you know, we'll see what that accent ends up being looking like uh, after COVID, we saw a high adoption of cloud rates in, in organizations. Um, and we move from that very fixed to variable um, consumption model and then put on top of that sort of any sort of macroeconomic instability, right? And we've got, you know, here in Australia, we've obviously got some tensions with China. We've had the COVID, you know, thing and then the whole like uh, Trump administration for, for years has put pressure on what, what is the, the you know, uh, operating um, environment that our businesses will be working on. And, that sort of puts pressure on the, the business to look at finance and say, well, how are, how is our spending? How are, you know, are, you know, are we being um, careful with our money just because we don't know what, you know, next week's going to bring. Um, and that's when those questions sort of go towards finance where you've got no communication happening um, that they look at the cloud bill and they're maybe a bit, bit surprised that they're spending a bit more than they thought they were. Um, this also happens a lot when you hear, companies going through their, you know, the cloud transformation or digital transformation or all those buzzwords that you hear, they was always, always hear like that paired up with um, teams saying that, you know, the projects are high priority for the business. We just got to do it no matter what the cost is, or, you know, we're moving to cloud. It's just doesn't matter what's cost, but it's got to get it done by this date. Um, and that doesn't matter about the cost. Um, always, makes me do the double blink as well. Cause I think that when you say it doesn't matter about the cost, that means the cost is going to be big um, and it's going to hit the point where you end up with bill shock. Um, and at the time when you get bill shock within an organization, uh, everyone starts to try and figure out the AWS bill or the you know, Google bill. And you work out that these things are super complex. Like you, you're, you're paying for things that, and, you know, per millisecond at hundreds of you know, thousands of different resources. Um, and so what happens is the business now feels like they've lost control of, of the finance. So they've lost control of the spending and, and I hear horror stories of you know, companies that are you know, banned from deploying anything new. They're, they've been told to turn off stuff that they don't need. They're, they're even worse, told to migrate, migrate back to the data center so that they can get control of costs again. And, and it's this like reaction that we think is completely avoidable if we can actually just insert some uh, good cloud, uh, cloud financial management practices into the organization. Um, and this is why we need FinOps within the org. The, um, the other thing I found in the state of DevOps reports that I found was really uh, aligns with the way we think. Um, these two statements that I found in there that the, the um, the nearly all, all adjacent business functions are ultimately part of the software process that they need to evolve alongside the technical de technical delivery teams. And when we think about that from a FinOps perspective, we say that you know DevOps plus cloud means that IT can move at a very fast pace. And the, the you hear this a lot with the success stories of cloud. They're always focused on the technical um, you know level of expertise that they had to you know overcome the, the, the amount of you know, retraining in the, the technical aspect of it and the, the migration strategy, the, the technicals of getting all of their 100 micro, 100,000 microservices into the cloud or whatever. Um, but what you don't realize is that every success story like that has gotten uh, other teams around the, those, uh, the technical team, the teams around them have actually skilled up as, as well. Um, you know, when I talk to some of the biggest cloud spenders, um, in the in the purview of cloud financial management, they have very versed and practiced models around how they think about that cloud bill, and it's almost they they've got their own DevOps teams themselves. Um, and so, 
we need to be able to move the rest of the business at the pace that IT is able to move at once you start to be able to get, um, you know, fast paced IT. And um, actually to see them call out FinOps in, in their paper was interesting as well. I didn't even realize that happened until I dug more into the report that, um, that you know, they're, this idea that the principles and practices of, of DevOps can be adapted into other areas of, of the collaboration space between um, now the DevOps teams and the rest of the business. And so I think that, you know, DevSecOps has obviously got a few years on us um, in that, that model, but uh, I think that FinOps and many others are going to start to come. And so the tagline for FinOps is really around financial accountability with the variable cost models of cloud. And so we sort of, um, you know, we hear that we, I, across the term, and you'll hear me keep flicking back and forth between cloud financial management and FinOps. Cloud financial management is kind of the, 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 the sort of what we're doing, you know, like running services for a DevOps team is kind of what you're doing. Um, cloud financial management is really what we do. Um, and FinOps is just a, a prescriptive way of thinking and, and a def definitive set of um, principles that we apply to cloud financial management. Um, and this was um, one of the things that we got a lot of prior to building out um, the FinOps Foundation was a lot of people were just asking that they needed something to be able to point at, something that they could say, that is the best practice. And there is some entity there that's helping, you know, uh, turn this into something that, you know, the business can trust, right? There was a lot of fear for um, tech companies to be sort of going out on a limb by implementing some team that they've never heard of before within their organization. And we kind of had to define that there is such such thing as a FinOps role within an org and show that there are other companies that are successfully using this practice. Um, the other thing that we want to point out here is that we really do want to enable those distributed teams that, um, to just continue doing what they're doing, but just build that collaboration with the business and with finance. And so that there's a constant feeling that they have control of the costs, they understand what's happening. Um, and we want to move the, the decision process away from the dollars themselves, like the total number of dollars to the actual value that we're getting from that cloud spend. And I think I'll, I'll make some more sense of that soon. And so really what we want to sort of see is this like engineers and finance is kind of acting as one uh, coherent team, right? The, the, the collaboration between them means that the, you know, the company feels like it's one space where, where DevOps teams are able to um, do what they need, but with enough information flowing around. Um, we want to meet, leave that procurement being instant. We want you to still have infrastructure as code and, and the ability to spend money through automation. Um, I, you know, the, the sort of locking things down and slowing the company down doesn't actually benefit anybody really. And I think that if I was a DevOps practitioner at a company told that you can't, you know, if, do anything with code, um, you'd have to go to finance to get approvals that uh, I would go find another company. The, um, the agile experimentation. So when we, we survey our companies are saying like, why did you go to cloud? Um, cost pops up usually on the word cloud, but it, it quickly falls away as one of the smaller elements. The, the big reasons that you know, people always say that they went to cloud is around scalability, the, the um, agility of cloud, the, 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 you know, the reliability of, um, of the cloud. And so it's, it's like all these other reasons are the main points to go to cloud. And so we really want to make sure that that's the thing that, that is held front and foremost to being able to maintain the access to this. Um, because if you take away the agility of cloud, then you may as well stay in the data center because you're not getting all of those benefits. Within FinOps though, we'd say that it's a culture within the business. So we'll have a practitioner, kind of like a DevOps engineer is a DevOps, um, you know, is, is someone in the, in the org, but DevOps itself is a culture within the way the company operates. It's, um, and so same thing happens within FinOps as well. We, it's not like one person, you just hire one and you put them in the corner and now you're doing, De um, doing FinOps. The FinOps practitioner is there to help the whole company um, upskill and think about um, costs. And so we have a set of principles. And so, um, you know, at Atlassian, we have sort of core values and, and they're pretty famous mainly because they've got swear words in them, but we use them to sort of divine how we think and how we operate and how we build practices. And so the principles for us in FinOps are sort of the same thing. Like everyone's org tree is slightly different. The, the requirements you have from, the, you know, your industries are different. The 
the skill sets that, that are already in, inside your companies are different. So you will come up with your own sort of processes around cloud financial management, who's involved in it, et cetera. But we want to make sure that if you, as you're building that process out inside your company, you, you're aligning with these principles. Um, and you can see number one, it's about collaboration. We need to have that collaboration between teams. There's, you know, and as DevOps engineers, you have different motivators in what you're trying to achieve for the business than a finance person has. But really, reality is if you step back and look at the two motivations together, you see that the whole thing is about you know accelerating the company. And so if we can sort of come to come to terms on on what the motivations are for teams and, and sort of come to compromises on what information needs to flow between them, uh, it really enables FinOps within the org. We um, move this uh, model where the value of cloud is what's driving the decisions. And I'll get to a section um, in a moment about unit economics that will pull all of that together. Um, everyone takes ownership of the cloud. This is a key thing that we want to change within the, the you build it, you run it model. We want to introduce cost as just another metric. Um, and I'll cover once again in a second about what I mean by that. But effectively, um, as users of the cloud, as, as the ones that are writing the code that's consuming the cloud, you need to understand that, that that's your responsibility now to think about that, that consumption of cloud and, and give the right um, level of detail for the business to understand what that consumption is and, and where it's headed and what, what driving, what's driving those, that consumption. For the FinOps practitioner, we, we need to make sure that we're not just waiting for the month bill at the end of the month or you know, worse at the end of the quarter. We need to move this to a more of a, a model where the data about your spending is, is coming in a lot quicker. Um, we, we talk about it like a, a Prius um, you know, model or a Tesla model, if you will, where if you get a nice old 1970s car and you fill it up with gas and you drive down the freeway, you have no real feedback loop to tell you how the efficiency of the car until you sort of empty the tank and then look back at sort of how many miles you've got per gallon. Whereas in a nice brand new, you know, electric Tesla or, you know, Prius car, as soon as you drive that car, as soon as you put your, your foot on the pedal, it gives you instant feedback of the sort of the way you're driving and the, the way it's impacting the, the consumption of, of energy. Um, and it's not so much that the car puts up a big warning saying that you're being inefficient, but it just lets you know of your efficiency and, and usually naturally you'll become a better driver or a more efficient driver. And, and we see the same thing happen with cloud costs. We need to, if we show you what the costs are that, that are happening based on your deployments and changes you're making close to the times that you're making them and those um, spend is more than you were expecting, you'll find that teams will naturally cor correct course during the month instead of finding out at the end of the month that that change they made, you know, five days into the month doubled their costs for the rest of the month. Um, centralized team that driving FinOps. So this is where the practitioners will live. They'll either come from the finance side of the house or the engineering. And we, we actually thought that we would find sort of a, a pinpoint somewhere on the org chart where you should be um, as a FinOps practitioner. But what we found was um, across the world, they, they seem to sit anywhere in the org tree. It doesn't really seem to matter. What does um, come out as important though is they're like a dotted line reporting. So for us at, at Atlassian, my FinOps team sits under the CTO, but I meet with the, the, the CFO side of the house all the time and, and have a lot of collaboration with them and thinking about their goals. And so that dotted line reporting is really the more important piece to it, sort of more than where you sit this team within your org. Um, and then taking advantage of the variable cost model of cloud. And this, this one's kind of funny. I've, I've heard of companies where they stopped auto scaling everything. They just scaled everything to max because then they knew how much they were going to spend. And it was like the kind of complete opposite thing to you would want to do with cloud. Um, but, it, and so we sort of bring this to the forefront that the, the variable cost model of cloud, it, it's seen as an enemy because of the, you know, the, the amount that that drives, um, uh, unpredictability with cost but I think once you get over that hump of, of you know the unpredictable um, cloud costs and you kind of start to get better forecasting models and a lot more collaboration on, on the cost drivers you'll start to see variable cost model of cloud as the huge advantage and um, you know we can measure actually how much we save by having a variable cost model once you get the right level of metrics um, and reporting happening there. FinOps itself has an action life cycle that we move from inform where we're building visibility of costs, vis visibility into the performance of our, our um, 
FinOps team in general, like as we make actions and, and change, which we'll get to in the operate phase. In the optimized phase, we're looking at what are those opportunities to drive more efficiency and, and setting goals and KPIs on, on what's reasonable for us to drive uh, more efficiency in the cloud. And so we're earmarking stuff that we want to achieve at the op optimized phase. And then as we go to the operate phase, we're starting to build the processes, the, the allocating responsibilities um, and, and working on automation, in, et cetera, to help us achieve those goals. Um, but it's really important to realize that as soon as you make a change with your infrastructure, we want to move straight back to inform and start to measure that that's had the desired effect. So if I'm, you know, having teams turn off resources that are idle sitting in their cloud, I need to go back and actually inform teams what the benefit of that effort has been and then move back around. And so we sort of continue through this life cycle loop, moving through, looking at increasing our goals as we go. And if I could just do a talk like this or write a book or build a foundation and then just everyone click overnight, we're all the most efficient cloud spenders in the world, then I would be super happy. But the reality is, is we just can't. Like we all have to go through the learning curve of implementing FinOps. And I'm sure that there's parallels to, you know, overnight, you can't just go from a centralized um, ops team that's been doing that for years. And now all of a sudden, everyone in the company does, you build it, you run it. Like it doesn't, just doesn't happen. It's a culture that builds over time time and so we we really do talk about this idea of starting small you know don't try and bite off too much in one cycle and then over time you build confidence and you build more awareness around the company and then you get sort of through the phases or the through the maturity curve of, of implementing FinOps within the org um, and then coming back to that business value of cloud drives um, the decisions the best way I can explain this is like it's effectively all what we want to transition from is, is instead of just talking about a total dollars spent in cloud, we want to work out how much of something we get for every dollar spent. So like, um, and so if, um, you know, if, if you're someone like Slack, you might be looking at, you know, paid enabled users or month, daily active users, something like that. If you're someone like uh, Spotify or Netflix, you're looking at the, the streams, right, to their customer. And so you're talking about the cost per stream or the cost per daily active user. Um, and the reason why this is super important is, um, if I draw a parallel with Slack or Zoom, beginning of 2020, you know, first day of the year, I'm sure their budgets were, you know, fairly reasonable for what they thought 2020 was going to look like. Um, by March, the world goes into lockdown and every man and his dog is buying more Zoom and more Slack than they would ever predicted. And if they just looked at the top dollar line, I'm sure that Slack and Zoom were spending way more in cloud than they ever they, you know, had imagined in their budgets. And so it's hard to then say, well, you know, is that a good thing? And so you could say, well, we have more customers and we're spending more money, but what you know, uh, economics gives us is this idea that we can say, well, we're now spending less per, per daily active user than we predicted we would be by this time. And it's because of the economies of scale that they would have had with you know, so many more customers. Um, but, and so by doing that, you're able to actually answer to the business that yes, cloud spend is up you know, 50%. But the actual efficiency of our cloud is is you know even is improved, um, and so that really changes the the conversation away from just a dollars on the on the top line and it's exceeding some budget into some uh, more sort of valuable conversation. And, and the side effect of that will be you know when we're looking at things like if you're going to build out a DR solution, you know what the impact is for the cost per mile, um, you know, for that DR, because you can predict the increase in cloud spend, and then you can back predict that against your current mile rates. And so you can say, well, you know, implementing DR means that the, the amount of cost we add per customer is, is, you know, 25 cents or something like that. And so you can start to figure out ahead of time, whether that fits within your pricing model within the company. And, and so you're moving away from the dollars of implementing DR, but the actual, how that relates to the customer. This one's a super deep and it's really just a run stage thing where we, we need to get through all of the sort of visibility and optimizing for us to, and, and uh, cost allocation processes, et cetera, for us to get into a, into a position where we can start to do um, FinOps um, you know, economics. And so I think that hopefully in the next sort of few years, this becomes a much well-trodden path that lots of companies are doing it, you know, not just the shining stars like your Spotify's and your Netflix's. And I told you that I would come back to this slide around engineers um, taking action. And so I think this is a, um, 
as I said, I think it's just slightly badly worded in, in as far as what choice we chose the words for, because I think it's not so much that the engineers aren't wanting to change action. It's just that most companies, um, the, the way that FinOps is set up today is there's a, some report somewhere, there's a tool they're using somewhere else on the web and engineers aren't naturally going to these other tools. And, um, and so I'm talking a lot now, um, you know, in my role at Atlassian about putting the insights in the path of the engineer. And so what we're saying is when we look at the way engineers organize themselves and, and measure themselves and, and, and prioritize work, you know, they meet on, on, you know, weekly rituals and they pull in all of their security stats and reliability stats and, and their um, you know, performance and, and incidents. And they're having these conversations about how their services are running. And we want to just introduce ourselves in that process as cost as a metric. And so the inside, they're not, we're not asking engineers to go somewhere else in, in addition to their normal workflows. We're actually putting the value, the, the um, recommendations and spend, et cetera. Those metrics become part of the normal conversations I already have. And then when it comes to recommendations that we want them to make change, um, it's no good to have that in some other report somewhere, we want to actually put it hopefully into JIRA for everybody uh, into their JIRA workflow so they can prioritize their work like they do for every other fee, feature fix and bug fix, uh, feature and bug fixes, et cetera. And so I think there's a problem that we're seeing in the industry at the moment where a lot of the FinOps practices are trying to make the engineers go somewhere else. And instead of trying to introduce the, the cost in the FinOps practices into the workflows. And so this is an area where I think we're going to continue to evolve. Um, and, and the way I think that this would be really uh, open to the whole group here is we have a, a engineering special interest group within the FinOps Foundation. We want to hear more from the engineers about the right way for, you know, for, from their perspective, the right way for FinOps to engage their workflow. Um, but anyway, the, the FinOps.org is, is here is a Linux Foundation project, as I mentioned. Um, and the idea here is it's a continue evolve. Like I, I would hope to have the book completely out of date, you know, within 12 to 24 months because we've all collaborated and come up with even better ways to do things. And, uh, you know, that'd be a really great outcome. And so that's the slides that I have, but I'm definitely open to as many questions um, from the group and I don't see the chat anymore. So let me find that. Chat's up. Will did you want to take questions or you want me to do it? Um, I think you're the question master, Tim, if you're really I am. <laughs> I thought you might want to slip it and grab it. All right, let's start at the top there. Christian, Christian, what is the biggest, uh, everybody wants to know this one. What's the biggest <laughs> cloud horror story you've ever heard about? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I heard about a company that spent $2 million on reserved instances and they bought all Red Hat instance um, reserved instances. And, but the, what they didn't realize is they were using BYO key, BYO license. So the actual EC2 instances that they bought the reservations for were just generic Linux. And so they had spent $2 million to now pay <laughs> that on top of their normal usage. Um, and so... Uh, I think there was a bit of uh, help from from Amazon on that one, but it's a pretty good one uh, to not realize what you're purchasing doesn't actually save you money. And the, the cloud providers are usually pretty good like that when you make a big food bar like that, isn't it? As long as you're on it quick enough. Like for us, um, you know, when we made our first reservation purchase way, way back in 2013, you know, we, we were also in a phase of like a hyper growth phase. And so we, we purchased, you know, what we thought was a huge amount of money um, in our eyes back then, but kind of laughable today. Um, but the next month, the bill was just, just bigger, like by the same sort of proportions. And we spent so long trying to figure out whether or not we we're saving money. Um, and the, it was kind of one of the, the early sort of points where we, we realized that you just need to be able to uh, like tease apart this cloud bill and really understand what's going on inside it because we just, we, and, and we were saving money. It was just that we grew so much in a month that by the time the bill come in, it, it just hid all the savings inside of it. Uh, what have we got next here? Oh, like this one was for me. So um, you're working with finance people quite a bit, I imagine. And for them, it's very different world and, how are they coping with it? And even reporting up to the board and stuff like that, how does that, some boards, I imagine uh, technical boards are quite savvy on this, but for other companies, it's, yeah. So we talk about this language of FinOps um, and, you know, I think that 
there's a lot you can do within the reporting structure that you create. So for us, it's like, do, do, does the board need to know that we have 100 reserved instances or does, does the board need to just know that we're saving 80% of our potential savings, right? And so there's a way of like just churning it back to sort of percentages and numbers that finance are very happy with. Because if you, if you give a report that says we have 100 reserved instances, the next question is, is what is a reserved instance? And the reality is it doesn't matter to someone in finance what a reserved instance is. What, what matters is how much it's saving us and, it, and could we purchase more of them to save more? Um, and what is the risk that comes in with that? And so we look at sort of like, can we avoid as much of the sort of cloud specific language in the way we collaborate um, as possible? And then on the flip side, there's just sometimes it's unavoidable. Um, and so we have to start to educate both sides. Like, you know, we, we hear, of, you know, I've, I've learned terms as an engineer um, prior to really getting into FinOps that, that just seemed foreign to me, like net present value calculations and CapEx versus OpEx. Like these were words that I was just like, who uses those words, right? But then it's the same thing happens on the finance side when you start talking about you know, the cloud is full of acronyms and they just sit there and look at you like blankly. And so it's very much like, can we just pick the language you use and then can we educate both sides? 